Well, good morning, Cornerstone family. I'm so glad you're joining us online. Today we are wrapping up the book of 1 Peter. And so I'd like to kind of go over where we've been over the last several weeks. Our big idea has been this. Jesus is our living hope who sustains us through the trials of life. Our hope is a living hope because Jesus rose from the grave. We're just a couple of weeks away from celebrating Easter Sunday, and I hope you can join us online. I hope you can even join us in person. We're going to have two amazing services, a 9.15 and 11 o'clock service, and also the whole weekend is planned out with great festivities. At 11 o'clock on Saturday and 11 o'clock on Sunday, we have two big family events, so I encourage you, bring your family out. It's going to be a blast. It's going to be a great time. Well, today, uh, as we read this verse, 1 Peter 1.3, one more time, this is our promise. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He is our living hope. We have a living Savior. And so as we go through the trials and struggles and the heartaches of life, we can have confidence that God is with us and he is for us. So let me review just where we have been. Uh, week one, we talked about uh, we have a living hope. Peter encourages us. We have a living hope. God is with us. He's, he, he is alive. Jesus is alive. Our hope is in God's grace and mercy in Jesus Christ. Then we talked about uh, how our faith is refined, and we are to exercise self-control. As we start to grow in our faith, we, we start to add, we, we mature, we, we grow in our faith, our knowledge and our application of our knowledge, and that should affect our relationships. And then week three, we talked about the need to help people find and follow Jesus, this is our mission. This is our purpose. As a believer in Christ, you are first a disciple of Jesus. That means you are to grow in your faith, to know him better and better. But then you're also, as a disciple, to be a disciple maker. Help other people come to know him and live their life to know him. And then week four, Peter encouraged us to an uncompromising faith to be men and women of integrity, to resist the temptation by setting good boundaries in our lives. Uh, week five, we talked about faith that blesses our marriages. Our, our faith, as we start to take personal application of God's word, it starts to change the way we live. We start to show more respect and honor and kindness and, and valuing people more, and, and especially as husbands and wives, we need to save our families. We really need to save our families. And the only way we will is if we start to apply God's word in our own personal life. And I realize how precious and valuable my wife is. And, and our, we value our husbands, our wives. Um, faith that blesses our family. And then week six, we looked at preparing for battle. That we are in a spiritual battle. That there is spiritual darkness, uh, but we have the victory in Christ because he rose from the grave. So prepare yourself for spiritual battle. And then week seven, we talked about to stand strong when faith is on trial. That was last week, that we need to stand strong in our faith. And, and today, we're going to wrap up the series on what he talks about being a godly leader. Now, in chapter five, Peter he will address elders, and, and there's application for myself or any pastor, elder here, uh, but there's also application for any leader in the church and also at home in your workplace. I, I think there's that secondary application that we all should be godly in the way we lead. We should show uh, a servant's heart, and we should really care about the people that we serve. Uh, there's a myth about leaders. Um, you probably have heard leaders are born. They're not. Leaders are made. They're made by the decisions that they make. You know, and, and as they make right decisions, godly decisions, their character is developed. And, and so each of us, I believe, we have influence at home. 
We have influence maybe at school. We have influence at work. And so we are leaders. All of us are leaders. So even though Peter writes this to the pastor elders, and and I, I want us to take that seriously, that's the primary application here today, I also want us to, one, keep us accountable as, as leaders. You need to. But also, let's think about how we ourselves can have that godly influence in our homes, that influence towards our spouse, that towards our children. Children have influence towards your, your parents, your teachers, our neighborhoods, our workplace. So if I want to be a godly leader, uh, here's the first step is, I will lead by example. I need to lead by example. Not just say what to do, but do what needs to be done. And Jesus was that perfect example. He led by example. 1 Peter 5.1, Peter says, And now a word to you who are elders in the church. I too am an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ. And I, too, will share in his glory when he is revealed to the whole world. I I like the humility uh, of Peter. I, too, am an elder. Are you kidding me? I'm not on the same level as, as Peter. But you see, his attitude is, we're servants. We lead by example. We're helping people begin a relationship and grow in the relationship with Jesus Christ. Such humility. He says, as a fellow elder, I appeal to you, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. So don't lord it over the people assigned to your care but lead them by your own good example. We need to care. As as elders, shepherds, first primary application here, we need to care for the people that come to church that are under our care. He talks about uh, a sheep. You know, why sheep? Well, because we're all sheep. As Isaiah said, we have each gone to our own way. Sheep are dumb. You know, we we go our own direction. We're stubborn. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm stubborn, right? And and we need direction. We need people to shepherd us, to encourage us. And and so um, I have leaders in my life. You have leaders in your life. And and we need each other together to walk this faith that we have. So as a leader, um, Jesus set the best example. He left his throne in heaven, and he came down to earth giving up all the luxuries of heaven where he could not suffer any kind of pain, any kind of mocking, never was exhausted, but came down to earth, put on flesh so that he could become our servant and lay down his life for us. So to watch over the sheep, uh, the example here is, you know, you, you feed. Sheep need to be fed, right? And so as, as an, a pastor, as an elder, as a teacher, as a Sunday school teacher, as a leader in the church, whether you're an elder, deacon, or Sunday school leader, someone that leads in the band or in, in the junior high, high school, or wherever you're leading, help people know God's word. Be faithful teaching God's word and always make it applicable. That's one of the principles that we have here, whether I'm teaching or Rich is teaching or Joey or James, whoever's teaching, we always want it to apply to our own hearts first. Because we feel as a speaker, if it applies to our hearts, hopefully it's going to apply to your heart. And that you could see the example in our own lives, that you could look at our marriages, that you could look at our families and you can see, yeah, that's real. And that works, you know, as we apply God's word in our lives. I think one of the, the biggest complaints against the church is the church is full of hypocrites, right? People that say one thing but do the opposite. Well, that should never be. And so we we make a big effort to have 
personal application, beginning with us. Shepherds, they guide, right? They guide their sheep. Uh, they give them direction. They keep them away from dangerous paths. Shepherds also, they go after the lost sheep. And, and so that should be the heart of any leader is to look for those who are spiritually seeking, to look for those who are spiritually hungry. And then to protect them and restore them. I, I know right now we've been praying over a card, each of us to give away each week, to invite someone to come to our Easter celebration, Saturday and Sunday at 11 o'clock. There are people that are hungry, spiritually hungry, people that are thirsty. And you are a leader. You are. You have influence in your home. You have influence in your neighborhoods, influence at your school, influence at your work. And if you invite somebody, they'll have some weight to it, especially if they're spiritually hungry. People are looking for a place to celebrate Easter this year. There are, there are people that have not been to church in maybe a couple of years. This is a great opportunity to invite those who are seeking the Lord. Then he says in verse four, he, he says, and when the great shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of never ending glory and honor. God is coming back. <laughs> Jesus is coming back. And I wanna be ready. And when he comes back, I'm praying that our church and all churches that teach the name of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior are full, so that heaven would be full. Paul gives an example of what it means to be a teacher that leads by example. He, he talks to a young pastor named Timothy. And in 1 Timothy 4, Paul describes five ways and I thought these were very tangible ways that we could be an example. He says to young Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, in purity. Each of those areas, that's application the way I talk, the way I live my life, the way I love and care for people, my personal faith, my life of purity. If you want to lead, if you want to be a leader, a godly leader, then these are five areas to keep investing in and growing in. So if you want to be a godly leader, first step, I will lead by example. Second step is serve with humility. Jesus gave us that example. Imagine washing the feet of the disciples. Now, I'm not a foot person, so that just grosses me out to begin with, but usually if I were to wash someone's feet, I'm sure they would have socks on, so they peel off the socks and right. But we're talking wearing sandals on dirt roads where donkeys and cows and sheep and other, you know, <laughs> not a clean, dirty road, you know. I and mean, it's like, wow, and and then you're gonna wash their feet. But Jesus set the example by washing the feet of the disciples, giving them an example of what it means to serve. Peter, he goes on here, he says, in the same way you younger men must accept the authority of the elders and all of you serve each other in humility. So now he's bringing the whole congregation in. Everyone serve each other with humility. For God opposes the proud but favors the humble. Now we have the example how Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. It should have been one of the disciples washing his feet and, and everybody else, but no, no, no. 
Jesus led that example. So I am sure as Peter is writing this, he's thinking back and he's remembering that moment when Jesus humbled himself and started to wash the feet of the disciples. I don't know if you remember that story, but Peter was like, no way, this is never going to happen. I'm not going to let you touch my feet. And Jesus like, no, no, this is an example. You need to be part of this. If I don't wash your feet, you have nothing to do with me, Peter. And so Peter's like, all right, give me a bath. He's like, no, 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 your feet will be good enough. Serve. Serve each other with humility. Pride Pride will destroy a church. Pride will destroy a business. Pride will destroy a marriage. Do I have an amen on that? We know that. I I know maybe right now, even some of you at work, you're just stuck in your pride. And, And the wheels of progress have just grinded to a halt. I know some of us right here are been watching online. Our marriages have kind of slowed down because of pride. I'll read what he says again. God opposes the proud, but he favors the humble. Some of us need to humble ourselves today before we get home and when we get home. Verse 6, he says, So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time he will lift you up in honor. Don't worry about position. Don't worry about titles. Just serve. Serve with humility and watch God start to work. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. I I know life is not easy right now. Life is complex. It's difficult. There are hardships that are going on right now financially, relationally, health-wise. Our country, our government. Humble yourself. Serve one another and watch God start to work in his timing you'll see his blessing. I think one of the perfect examples that Jesus gave to the disciples was right after he had shared that he's going to the cross. And if you just put yourself in that position for a moment, Jesus just shared, he's gonna die for your sins, for my sins, for the sins of the world. Where would your thoughts be? Where would your attitude be? What would you be thinking? What would be the next words out of your mouth? I'm sure it wouldn't have been what John and James are saying, you know, but they're asking, hey, can, can one of us be on the left, one of us be on the right? When, when you get to heaven, can we serve? You know, like, can we be the leaders next? Of course, you get the middle seat, but can we be on the sides, you know? And Jesus is like, Ah, oy vey. You know, I get to see him doing that, you know. Um, Mark 10, 42. Jesus calls the rest of the disciples. So the other 10, come on over, guys. It's time to have a chat. You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Wow. Talking about an attitude of service, serving one another. What an attitude of humility. Jesus, the Lord of heaven, the Lord of creation, is giving his life as a ransom. So if we give up a little extra sleep by getting up early, 
to make our spouse coffee. Or maybe we get up a little early to put bacon on the frying pan so our teenage son will actually get out of bed for <laughs> for some reason. And what do we give up? A little time, a little inconvenience. Maybe we stay a little late at work because we're helping out a coworker. You know, we, we clock out. We don't, we're not doing the overtime bit, but we're just trying to help somebody that we know they need a little help that go a long ways. Wow, what a difference that will make. This isn't about making a name or a title. It's about serving others. If you want to be a godly leader, you need to be a servant. If you want to be a godly leader, you need to lead by example. Be the one who teaches God's word, who inspires others by the way you're taking God's word into your life. Be the example. Serve with humility. And then three, if you want to be a godly leader, stand firm against the enemy. We are in a spiritual battle. And the enemy, he wants to destroy our marriages. He wants to destroy our families. He wants to destroy our reputation at work. So be the example. Lead with humility and stand against the enemy. He says this in verse 8. He says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He, he wants to destroy us. Lions, they attack the sick. They attack the young, those who are slower, those who are isolated. They choose victims that are alone. Peter warns us to watch out for Satan when we are suffering, when we're being persecuted, or we're going through hard times, the enemy, he's looking for an opportunity. That's why we need one another. That's why we need godly leaders. And, and that's why we need to stay together as fellow believers in Christ, that we lift each other up when we're weak. We lift each other up and we encourage each other. We pray for each other. We're there encouraging one another, serving together. He says in verse 9, stand firm against him. Be strong in your faith. Remember, your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering you are. There, there's persecution throughout this world. You're not alone in your persecution. You're not alone in your struggles. You're not alone in, in your family arguments and your family stress and your family finances. You're not alone in, in your work struggles and your work stress and, and the extra responsibility that just got thrown on your shoulders recently. We're doing this life not alone. We're in this together. We're going through the same things. Don't ever think you're alone. That's the way the devil isolates you. Realize that there are people that are around you. They care. They love you. They're with you. They're for you. We are God's family, his sons and daughters. We together work together. We support one another. He, he goes on, he says, in, in his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Jesus Christ. So after you have suffered a little while, He'll restore and support and strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. Don't you love that? He knows what you're going through, and, and you're going to go through it for a bit. But then God's going to strengthen you. <laughs> He's going to restore you and, and strengthen you and support you and place you on that firm foundation. I think most of us can probably look back over the last two years, five years, ten years, and, and see the progression of our faith, it's gotten stronger as we keep reaching out to Jesus, as we keep serving him, as we keep loving on him. God is for us. He's not against us. And over the horizon, 
He's coming back soon. He says in verse 12, I, I have written and sent this short letter to you with the help of Silas, whom I commend to you as a faithful brother. My purpose in writing is to encourage you and assure you that what you are experiencing is truly part of God's grace for you. Stand firm in his grace. Your sister church here in Babylon sends your greetings, and so does my son Mark. And do you get that? Sister church where? Babylon. Okay, this is the image of the evil empire of Satan, right? Peter's like, yeah, you're not alone. We're in this together. And we already had the victory because Jesus rose from the grave. Greet each other with Christian love. Peace be with all of you who are in Christ. Stand firm in his grace, guys. And his grace and mercy. Jesus is our living hope. And we, we celebrate Easter here just in a couple of weeks. And again, Easter weekend is going to be off the hook awesome. And I encourage you to invite someone, invite a family each week, invite a new family each week. We had, we had two new families that came last week because of you inviting. That's awesome, <laughs> and I'm praying that it just continues to build and build until we hit Easter. But remember, every Sunday, we're celebrating that Jesus rose from the grave, and we celebrate together because we need one another. We need the strength of one another. We need godly leaders. We need godly pastors and elders and teachers and Sunday school teachers and, and youth pastors and directors. We, we need that, but we also need godly leaders in our homes Godly leaders in our businesses, in our schools. You know, I, I've over the years, I've seen students lead their teachers to Christ. I've seen teachers lead their students to Christ. I've seen parents lead their children to Christ. I've seen children lead their parents to Christ. I've seen grandparents lead their grandkids to Christ. You have influence. You are a leader. Would you pray with me? Are you ready to lead? Lord, help us to have a servant's heart. Lord, you've given each of us influence in different areas, in our families, in our workplace, in our schools, our neighborhoods, in our church. Lord, I pray we'd lead by example with kindness, with understanding, valuing people, taking your word and applying it in our hearts. Lord, I pray that we would teach by leading a life that loves you. I pray that we'd seek the lost to restore them into a relationship with you. Lord, let us serve with humility. Lord, I pray that none of us would ever think that we're above anything. Lord, I thank you for the godly leaders that I see at this church that serve, that roll up their sleeves and are willing to get dirty to serve you, to help other people know you. Lord, give us the courage to stand against the enemy to stand up for our faith that, Jesus, you are alive and that you rose on Easter Sunday. Give us courage to invite others to come and celebrate with us on Easter weekend, Saturday and Sunday at 11 o'clock. Lord, I pray that it would be the most glorious Easter ever, that, Lord, you would just pack out this place, make it crowded so that heaven would be crowded. We thank you and we praise you in the powerful name of Jesus we pray. And God's people said, amen. If you made a decision today, please let me know. I'd love to encourage you in your faith. I'd love to pray for you. And so if you'd like us to pray for you, just please, uh, you can text us at 858-682-2424. That's 858-682-2424. And if you would like to be baptized as a believer in Christ, let me know. I'd love to celebrate with you. 
So just text me again, 858-682-2424. We'd love to celebrate with you. Until next week, God bless.